All right, so this lecture will review the specific duty rules that apply for premises liability. As we've already seen in class, the basic setup is the same as the three-step analysis that we've done for the general duty analysis. So we're going to customize certain parts of this analysis just for this kind of case. So generally speaking, in a premises liability case, there is no special rule for affirmative acts. The example I gave is if someone who owns property is backing their car off of their driveway and they strike a neighbor child, that affirmative act would be evaluated under a general duty analysis because there's no condition of the property that was really the cause of that injury. Generally speaking, the limits will apply where there is some failure to act on the part of the property owner and by virtue of that failure to act, someone gets injured. So in these omission cases, it's important to distinguish between a natural condition on the property and an artificial condition. Generally speaking, the property owner is not responsible for providing protections against natural conditions. Their only responsibility is going to be for artificial conditions or man-made conditions on the property. Our biggest um, analysis is going to be with regard to the scope. Here you're going to have to use the entrant classification system to determine what rules to apply to limit the scope of responsibility for certain types of parties who are injured on the property. We'll also look at specific rules that apply for invitees and for criminal attacks that cause them injury on someone's property. We said that in terms of the public policy that it's very specific to the nature of property that because property holds such a valued place in a capitalist society that we customize these rules to protect property owners because we want to promote property ownership and especially the business opportunities that flow from that. These diagrams are just a reminder about the basic setup or the nature of the entrant classification system. We saw that for trespassers, there's a very, very narrowly limited duty of care, which I'll describe more fully again in a moment. For licensees, there's a little bit more responsibility, but it's not a full-blown duty of care. We will see that invitees are owed a general duty of, of reasonable care, which means that their duty isn't limited at all. So you can think of this either as the series of concentric rings on the left, or you can think about it as the pyramid with trespassers having um, a very little share of responsibility at the top, licensees having a greater share of responsibility in the middle, and invitees getting the full duty of reasonable care at the very bottom. We'll take a look at each of the status categories within the entrant classification system, beginning again with trespassing adults, moving on to trespassing children, um, then turning to licensees and ultimately winding up with invitees. For each one, we'll define the status and we'll look at the test that's used to determine when someone falls within that status. And we'll look at either the limited rules that apply or in the case of invitees, the full duty of reasonable care. So just a reminder about trespassing adults, we said that a trespasser is someone who enters property without permission or consent. Once they're there, the responsibility of the landowner will really depend on whether the landowner could have predicted that the person would be on the property or actually knew that they were there. For unknown trespassers, the duty is generally speaking very, very low. It's simply to refrain from recklessly or intentionally causing the trespasser harm. However, if the landowner discovers the trespasser on the property or if it's foreseeable given past events that the trespasser might appear on the property, most jurisdictions say that there's at least a duty to warn of concealed artificial dangers on the property. Now for trespassing children, the rule that historically has applied is known as the attractive nuisance doctrine, and this is now incorporated into the restatement second, section 339. And it basically says that if the defendant knows or could foresee that the child will trespass on the property because of some attractive artificial condition on the property, then the property owner will have a duty of reasonable care to fix that condition or at least provide a warning against it. 
depending on the nature of the burden of doing so, um, but only for concealed dangers, not for dangers that would be obvious to the child. The one case we have here is the Bennett versus Stanley case where the court does adopt the attractive nuisance doctrine and even though a summary judgment had been entered for the defense, the court says there was enough here to suggest that the attractive nuisance doctrine could apply. This was a child who wound up drowning in somebody else's pool, which ultimately had been turned into a pond. The child had trespassed onto the property, um, but the property itself and the pool served as a kind of attractive nuisance. Kids love to play in pools, and so the property owner should have known that the child would be attractive or attracted to that um, condition on the property. There had been fencing up, but the fencing and the tarp on the pool had been removed. Um, they had no warning signs placed there, so it was foreseeable that a neighbor child, especially the children who lived next door, which the defendant was aware of, might come on to the property and wind up in that pool. And because of all of those facts, um, the defendant actually could be responsible under the attractive nuisance doctrine because it did appear that a reasonable person in the, in the landowner's shoes would appreciate that a child might come onto the property given all of those circumstances and ultimately be injured by that hazard. Now we're moving on to licensees and invitees. So, a licensee is a person who comes on to another person's property with consent, which basically gives them a license to be there, but they're there for either a social or some unilateral purpose. If that's true, then the duty rule is twofold. Um, as for trespassers, you can't recklessly or intentionally harm your licensees, but there's an additional requirement here as well. If you are aware of, that is, if you actually know of a concealed danger that is a non-obvious danger on your property, then you would have some obligation to at least provide a warning of that known concealed danger. You wouldn't have to inspect the property and you wouldn't have to fix things on the property, just simply speak up about the known concealed danger on the property. Now for invitees, there's two different tests that will determine whether or not someone will fall into this category. A person can be a business invitee if they enter the property with consent and they're doing it for a mutual business purpose. That is, they're either there to buy something immediately or there's some prospective chance that that visit might turn into some kind of business, business advantage for the um, property owner. So there's a kind of quid pro quo going on here that I'm coming onto your property for the purpose possibly of giving you my dollar and in return I'm looking for some protection. The other test is the public invitee test and this just simply says that if the property that you come onto is generally open to the public um, and you come on with consent then you're owed a, a duty of reasonable care. So the public invitation test would certainly apply to public property that if you come on to a public park then you would be a public invitee but it actually could apply to private property like businesses that are open to the public. So if someone comes into a business they could both be a business invitee or and they could be a public invitee. So as I was kind of suggesting here, the duty rule is a general duty of reasonable care to protect against the either dangerous activities or artificial conditions that are on the property. And these are the conditions that the owner and occupier either knows or should know uh, would expose the entrant, the invitee, to a risk of harm. A little bit later we'll talk about constructive knowledge. We've mentioned it already in class, but we'll see from one of the cases what exactly that means and how it can be applied. So what's the policy behind the invitee rules? Well, one of the policies is simple fairness, that if I am coming onto your property and providing you at least the prospect of my economic benefit, then I do expect that I will get full care provided to me uh, in return. Second is a safety consideration that 
businesses and properties that are open to the public because they have so many people coming onto the property um, there's a much greater chance that more people will be injured and so for public policy reasons we want to make sure that the property owners that are handling this mass of mankind um, trafficking through their property will do a good job of ensuring that they don't get injured and finally there's this idea of control reliance the essence of a special relationship that when you come into a store you generally expect the store will have the expertise necessary to think about safety and to provide the necessary means to protect you while you're there and so you're really vulnerable um, to injury because you're kind of giving up your trust to the property owner and expecting that they'll provide you with safety while you're um, within the four walls of the business. All right, now let's take a look at how these rules were applied in a couple of cases. We'll start with the licensee case of Norp versus Hale. We have the Hales who are about to have a New Year's Eve party and the boyfriend of their daughter decided that he would come over unannounced and cut down a tree where they were going to hold the bonfire. Well, he didn't do a very good job with his chainsaw. He actually caused the tree to fall on top of him. And by virtue of that, he wound up getting killed. And so his estate winds up bringing an action against the Hale folks based on premises liability. The question was, what was his status on the property? And the court determined that he was a licensee, that he had the right to be on the property, even though he wasn't given express consent for the purpose of coming over and cutting the tree. He was very close to the daughter and the Hales themselves. And so because he was like family, he had implied consent to come over. Uh, when he came over, he wasn't providing any kind of economic benefit. He was just simply cutting a tree for a social purpose. And so he was tolerated on the property, but he really wasn't conferring a direct economic benefit, and so he winds up being a licensee. Now, remember the rule for a licensee is generally speaking, you can't recklessly endanger them with an artificial condition. Well, the court actually says that there really wasn't a dangerous artificial condition because the tree was dead, but it wasn't detached from the ground, and so it really wasn't dangerous until the plaintiff cut it. There also wasn't a reckless disregard for his safety because they didn't even know that he was coming over to cut the tree. Uh, and ultimately, there's an argument that this entire danger was obvious, that the gentleman here was using the chainsaw and as he was cutting it, he could perceive what that danger might be and he was an experienced tree trimmer. And so ultimately, the hazard of the tree falling over is not a concealed danger, it's certainly a danger that he could have perceived on his own. And so for all of those reasons, whatever duty was owed under the licensee status um, was not violated under the facts of this particular case. In the invitee case, this is the Richardson versus Commodore case, um, we know that a gentleman comes into a bar and as he's shooting pool, he gets hit on the head by a piece of falling plaster. Everyone agrees that he's an invitee because he's at the bar spending money, um, presumably drinking beers and having a good time while shooting pool. The question is whether or not there's a violation of the duty of reasonable care. We said earlier that that duty of reasonable care requires taking precautions against known um, or knowable dangers. And this idea of a knowable danger is what we call the constructive knowledge doctrine. And so in this case, it, there was no evidence to, to show that the hotel was, or the bar was aware of the danger uh, posed by the plaster the actual plaster that came apart had been put up long before, um, I think in 1913. And even though the, the bar owner wound up doing some renovation to the ceiling, they didn't have direct knowledge that that plaster was loose and about to come down. But that doesn't absolve them of responsibility. If they reasonably should have known that that plaster could come down, then they're responsible. And the court does find there's enough um, factual dispute here that this case should not be decided on summary judgment but should go to the jury. And some of the facts that would support a finding of constructive knowledge are 
that the owner of the bar certainly knew that the underlying ceiling um, had been constructed very early, like I said, in 1913, and because of its old age could deteriorate, and as it deteriorates could fall. They had covered over the older version of the ceiling in 1985, but they didn't do any kind of inspection. And certainly they might have known that by covering over the lurking danger behind that, that drop ceiling, that there could be a hazard of the underlying ceiling breaking and falling down. Um, certainly if you own a building, there's at least the possibility that that plaster could sag and ultimately split apart um, and be a danger to the, the folks below. And so if they had done at least a visual inspection of that segment uh, of the roof, they probably could have discovered this danger and easily fixed it um, by just simply repairing that plaster. So the court basically says a reasonable person should have known because they should have taken all the information available to the, to the property owner, including the old age of the ceiling, the fact that it hadn't been repaired, the fact that it had been covered over and never really inspected, that creates an obligation for a reasonable person to basically take notice of the possible danger and do something about it. Now it's important to remember that the entrant classification of a person on a piece of property is not a fixed thing. Actually, the person's status can change over time depending on the scope of the occupier or owner's consent and the purpose for the entrant being on that property. I wanted to pull an illustration from a later case, the Nelson versus Friedland case, where I think the court did a very nice job illustrating how this can happen. So in this hypothetical, we've got a real estate agent who trespasses onto a property owner's land uh, to kind of take a look at the adjoining land. Um, at some point, the landowner comes out, they start having a conversation perhaps about business that maybe the landowner would hire the agent to do um, a property deal for him. And as they continue to talk, they learn that they went to the same college and they have a nostalgic conversation about the school. And as they're walking toward the edge of the property, the assumption is that the agent winds up getting injured. And the court raises the question, what's the entrant classification of the agent at the time that he winds up getting injured near the end of that last conversation? And so, it's clear that when he, the agent first came onto the property, he was a trespasser because he didn't have any consent. It does look like his status immediately changed into an invitee status because once the homeowner came out and didn't kick him off the property, there was at least implied consent for him to be, that is the agent to be there. And because the landowner and the agent began a conversation about business, his status, the agent's status, seems to have changed to one of invitee, invitor. But they now have a conversation that moves into a more kind of social tenor, that they start talking about school. And it might look, because they're moving from a business conversation to really more of a social conversation, that the agent's status has now transformed into that of a licensee. And that's certainly a reasonable argument for that. But there's also a reasonable argument that the agent's status, even during this conversation about school, could remain an invitee. Remember that an invitee is someone who comes on the property or is on the property, not only for a present economic benefit, but also if he poses some prospective or future economic benefit. And so if this conversation between the property owner and the agent really bonds them together and it makes it more likely that the property owner will hire the agent um, maybe to sell a, a property or that property in the future, then the social conversation might actually lead to a prospective economic advantage for the property owner. And so the agent could remain an invitee. This is an open question. And the fact that there's no clear answer to this is one of the reasons why the court in Nelson was so dissatisfied and even frustrated by the entrant classification system.
Okay, now we're moving from the rules that apply to artificial conditions on the property to criminal attacks that occur on the property. We're mostly going to be concerned with invitees because remember that there's very little duty owed to a trespasser or a licensee. And so unless you actually hired a criminal or gave encouragement to a criminal to injure a trespasser, or you actually knew there was a criminal on your property and you failed to give a warning about that criminal, I mean, it's not really going to be an issue for either trespassers or licensees. The big question is whether or not someone who owns property has an obligation to protect people on that property against criminal attacks that aren't known or directly encouraged by the property owner. So we're mostly concerned with invitees. We're going to use the Delta Tau versus Johnson case to kind of work through the various approaches here. Now, this is an Indiana case, and in Indiana, a social guest is viewed as an invitee. They actually don't make any distinction between people who are on the property for a unilateral purpose and people who are on the property for a business purpose. Anyone who has consent to be on the property is viewed as an invitee. So in this case, we had a young lady who had been invited to a fraternity party. And so she was really a social guest. She wasn't there spending any money. But again, she becomes an invitee just because of the law in Indiana. While she's there, she winds up talking to an alum of the school um, who takes her to an upstairs bedroom and ultimately she asks to leave and he continues to talk to her and eventually has her trapped in the room and rapes her. And so she winds up suing the fraternity arguing their negligence and their responsibility to protect her against this criminal attack. And so because she's viewed as an invitee, the court has to determine whether or not or under what circumstances she's entitled to protection against this kind of criminal mischief. So the court actually outlines four different tests that can be used to limit the scope of the property owner's duty of care with regard to a criminal attack. As the notes in the book point out, two of these tests are particularly important and I'm only going to go over these two. So the first, and this is one that's adopted by California, is called the Prior Similar Incidents Rule, or the PSI Rule. Under this rule, which is a narrowly limited scope of responsibility rule, the criminal act will fall within the scope of the property owner's duty only if there are or were prior similar acts committed on or near the property where the criminal attack occurred. So just to clarify there, it has to be on or near that property that something very similar had happened before. So how do you determine what kinds of prior criminal attacks would be similar enough to trigger the high degree of foreseeability necessary to make the property owner responsible for a subsequent attack. Well, the court says that you'd look at the number of prior attacks, just how close they were to this particular incident, how similar were they in nature, um, violence versus sexual assault, um, theft versus violence, right? You're going to make different kinds of comparisons to see if they're similar enough to put the property on notice, property owner on notice, that they've got a particular problem with a particular kind of crime. So, like I said, this is really a high foreseeability test unless you've got this high degree of foreseeability that something fairly specific will happen very close or on your property, then you wouldn't have a duty of care. But if in light of all of these um, prior criminal attacks that were very similar in nature, you were put on notice, then you'd owe a duty of reasonable care to protect against this subsequent criminal attack. Now, the court winds up rejecting this, but many jurisdictions, including California, do adopt this particular approach. If you were to apply it to the facts of this case, Let's see how you'd come out. Now, we know from the facts that there had been a couple of incidents in this fraternity before. There was an alcohol-related non-sexual attack, and there was a kind of vague spanking incident that occurred on the property within the past two years. The question is whether or not 
there is a frequency there and a similarity that would be sufficient to trigger the high foreseeability test of the prior similar incidents rule. I'm not sure that the non-sexual attack is similar enough to a rape to put the fraternity on notice that they have a specific problem there. Even the spanking incident seems to be substantively different from a rape um, to qualify as a similar attack. And so under this very high threshold, it doesn't look like this particular test would be satisfied. The court winds up adopting another test called the totality of the circumstances test for determining the scope of the property owner's duty for a criminal attack. But don't be thrown off by that. Really all the court is saying is we're going to use an ordinary foreseeability analysis and as part of that analysis we'll look at all of the surrounding circumstances to determine whether or not the plaintiff fell within the zone of danger created by the, the setup of that property. And so if you were just doing a general foreseeability analysis, could you find sufficient facts in this case that would alert the property owner to this kind of general lurking criminal danger around the fraternity? And so there are a number of factors that the court cites here that the nature of college parties because they're um, soaked with alcohol creates a danger that there could be some criminal mischief, that the fraternity had passed out information about the frequency of, of rapes on college campuses in fraternities, suggested that they may have been aware that this was a problem. As I indicated, the effects of alcohol generally, but also known to this particular fraternity, the fact that they knew that they didn't have any kind of security to protect people on the premises. There were at least prior inappropriate incidents that might have alerted them to the fact that when people drink, their inhibitions go down and they might be more inclined to do something that is untoward or even criminal. Um, and ultimately, if you take all of those things and put them together, the totality of the circumstances might lead a reasonable person to believe that it was reasonably foreseeable that this fraternity could have a criminal attack, including a rape, on their property. And so the court under that test says that the facts were sufficient to preclude a summary judgment and to send the case to a jury. Because of all the complexities in the entrant classification system, many jurisdictions have reconsidered it and actually have replaced it with different alternatives. The Nelson versus Freeland case does a good job of exploring some of the downsides to the entrant classification system and it highlights the two alternative approaches that are now gaining a lot of steam. So some of the arguments against the entrant system are that there's no longer any doctrinal basis for it because it was adopted in England and England has long ago abolished it. A lot of United States um, jurisdictions have also gotten rid of the entrant system and the United States Supreme Court really never adopted the entrant system in admiralty cases where it has its own jurisdiction. Historically, the doctrine is based on feudalism, which is now outdated, and it was really perhaps grounded in a distrust of jurors. And so today, because we have a lot more confidence in our jury system, there's no longer the fear of having to limit what we give to jurors in terms of the duties of care. There's also a moral question. Is it fair and humane to limit someone's responsibility just because of the purpose that they have for being on another person's property? A lot of jurisdictions think it's not humane and so have abandoned the entrance system because of that. And there's the practical consideration that when you have so many rules and exceptions that it's actually very difficult for the courts to administer that system and it's much easier to have a more simplified approach to entrant problems. And so two different approaches have arisen. One is just a general duty analysis. California, in fact, in Roland versus Christian, completely abandoned the entrant classification system and decided just to go back to a general duty analysis. Now, someone's purpose for being on the property remains relevant to the general duty analysis, especially in the foreseeability or scope part of it. That if a trespasser comes onto your property, gets injured, they're not likely to be foreseeable. That you generally expect only invited people to be on your property, 
um, and you wouldn't expect a trespasser to be there. And when you do the multi-factor policy analysis, remember one of the considerations there is the burden of adding precautions to your property in order to protect the person against injury. But if you don't really know when a trespasser is going to show up or where they're going to go, then the burden of safeguarding the property against that intrusion is going to be very, very high. So even though we no longer use the entrant classification system, a person's purpose for being on the property can show up in the certainly the scope for seeability and then the, the policy parts of the general duty analysis. The other approach, and this is the one that was adopted in the Nelson case, is a bifurcated entrance system. So instead of having three classifications, the trend is now to move toward just two. And the distinctions that are drawn is between licensees and invitees. And so anyone who has permission to be on the property, that is, if they have consent, they're viewed as an invitee and they're owed a full duty of reasonable care. But if you're a trespasser, that means you don't have consent, then the limited duty that we talked about before would apply. So the only obligation of the property owner would be not to recklessly or intentionally harm that party. So the reality is that there are three approaches to limiting or at least approaching the duties owed by owners and occupiers of land. There's the traditional entrant classification system that has three classes. There is the newer bifurcated system that recognizes the distinction only between invitees and licensees. And then there's the general duty analysis of Roland versus Christian in California, which eliminates all of the classifications and simply evaluates the good old three steps used in all other cases.